When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then if we can turn all the way back to Exodus chapter 33. And I'd like us to begin reading uh, from verse 7. Exodus chapter 33, verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent, that all the people would arise and stand each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. Um... Then down to verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Verse 18, then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. So, um, as you can tell, I wanted to share um, on this uh, story, uh, this example of Moses. And um, I am reminded when we thought, when I thought about this question of, you know, uh, do you know him? Uh, similar to what our brother Lucio shared last night. I was reminded back to the very creation story. What was God's original intention for us? What was God's purpose for creating man? And, you know, our brother Lucy already shared, right? We were created to know him. We were created to have fellowship with God. We were created to be worshipers of God. But, of course, we know that man chose to eat of the wrong tree. We know sin got in the way of that beautiful relationship that we were supposed to have with God from the very beginning. You know, I'm reminded how God would come down and walk in the garden with Adam. And when, and when sin came, that relationship, that connection we had, or we were supposed to have with God, was broken. And from that very moment, when that connection was broken, God did not, from the very beginning, at, from that connection being broken, God did not stop finding a way to restore that relationship to what it ought to be. And so he would go and find, and if, through, if you read throughout the Old Testament and of course into the New Testament, and, and we see that God had every intention to restore that relationship that we were supposed to have with God from the very beginning. Um, and and we do read though, in when we read the Old Testament, that there were certain individuals, right, that were able to, you know, find favor with God, whether because of their faithfulness, because of their righteousness. God was able to use these men um, for his purpose and have a, a, a actual and intimate relationship with them that you don't read in anywhere else. And so one of those examples is Moses. And as we read in Exodus chapter 33, what was that relationship like? It, it, certainly not like the relationship we, we hear about or, or think about, um, but God... And his relationship with Moses was like a friend speaking face to face. 
And so I wanted to share about Moses as an example, but I also wanted to relate it back to my personal experience as well. You know, this is a workshop. I wanted to be practical. And I actually thought, you know, I, I said that I felt like I had something to share with you who are going through college or even, out, you know, graduated college. Um, you guys are young adults. And so, you know, in my experience with the Lord, um, he has led me through um, um, in a very personal way what it means to come into having a personal and intimate relationship. And that means he, being led through failures, being led through humblings and, and things that the Lord had to deal with in my life. And so as a background, um, I think we all, you know, for the most part, I think we all are very similar. We all grew up um, in, you know, in a Christian home, believers. Uh, we've, most of us have probably been going to meetings for most of your life. And you've been sitting through Sunday schools and you've been sitting through lesson uh, uh, messages and you've been sitting through youth conferences and you've heard every single thing you probably can hear of, uh, of people, of brothers or, and, you know, and sisters teaching about things of the Bible. And I was very similar to that. I, I was saved at a very young age. I, I was baptized uh, start, just before I started high school. Uh, I, I I was I can say for certain that I uh, I was I, that I, that I was saved, I uh, received the Lord, but that relationship as an, as, our, as our brother talked about last night, a true relationship with God is a relationship of life, and life is uh, one that has to that there must be growth. But I could say when I was in high school, throughout much of high school and into college, and being in college, you know I I went through most of that in a very stagnant way where my relationship with the Lord was very superficial. I knew of the Lord. I certainly knew I was saved. But I didn't know him in a deep way. I didn't know him in an intimate way. I didn't know him, to be honest, really in a personal way. I knew him as a God of my parent, you know, my mother, as a God of my Sunday school teachers, a God of, you know, brothers and sisters. And that's what I think most of us grow up to know. We hear of who God is. But we recognize at certain at some point of our life that God wants who not who who knows you wants you to know him personally as your personal God someone you can intimately have fellowship with someone who knows you inside and out and he wants you to know him inside and out and so um you know my really you know I went through high school you know pretty much nominal Christian go saying I'm a Christian but not many people really saw that in my life I went through the beginning of college struggling with this matter of what does it mean to walk with the Lord? Because I didn't have that connection with him as I went through high school. But it, as we see in this example of Moses, what is the relationship we ought to have with God? It's a relationship that should be God, like a friend, speaking face to face. We see in Exodus chapter 33, Moses was able to have that conversation with him face to face. And we also read, we read in Numbers, you know, God says, um, um, as we read in, if we read in Numbers chapter 12, he would say that, you know, of all the people, you know, I speak to prophets in dreams or in visions, but not so with Moses. With him, I speak to him as a friend, face to face. And so that's, that speaks to me of that intimate relationship that God wants to have with each and every one of us. Um, you know, the thing is, what allows that to happen is because it's is through the Spirit. You know, God is spirit. And the only way we can communicate with God is in the spirit. Um, and only the spirit of God can reveal the things of God. And so it is through the spirit we can have that intimate relationship, that fellowship with God, the way we were meant to be, meant to have. But of course, that relationship, because of sin, was broken. And we know the, the things of this world, the things, uh, you know, can get in the way, Right. If we read in uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2, it says, what, what, what does 1 John chapter 2 say? Uh, Do not love the world or the things of the world. What, what, what are the things of the world that, 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 that are not of the Father? There are three things. This is where I'm calling on you guys. <laughs> Good, yeah. The lust, of the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. All, right? all speak of sin. All speak of the thing of our flesh. You know, I, I, and also speaks of, you know, things that we have in our lives as distractions and idols. 
you know, I don't have to, I'm sure I don't have to go into detail of why sin gets in the way of our relationship with the Lord, right? Um, I don't have to tell you about distractions or things like, uh, you know, what, you know, when we're distracted with things, when we have things that we put up uh, that we find more valuable and more worthwhile than God. Those are idols in our lives. Those things get in the way of our relationship with the Lord. I, I, and I also see the, what the boastful pride of life, you know, I, I, and that's what I wanted to focus on a little bit today, because sometimes, you know, I, I you know, we know pride gets in the way, but not, I, 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 but I wanted to speak of more of a, you know, in a subtle way, how, when our self life gets puffed up, or when we focus on the things in our self life, um, then it makes it difficult for us to really have a, that intimate relationship with God. And so I wanted to use Moses as an example because there's a period in Moses' life that isn't really mentioned or at least described in the Bible, right? That's the period of Moses' life, which is between chapters Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 3. And how many years was that in between those two chapters? 40 years, right? There's, there's like 40 years that that are, isn't mentioned in Exodus, although we see that uh, Stephen in, in Acts chapter 7 kind of fills in that like uh, gap a little bit, right? What, what did Stephen in a sermon talked about Moses being raised in the Egyptian courts, right? He was uh, raised, raised and learned the wisdom of the Egyptians, right? He was mighty in words and deed. He lived like a prince in, of Egypt, right? Um, you know, he had, he had everything going for him. And then... Of course, we know what he did. Um, he, 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 you know, he, he pretty much murdered a, an Egyptian. He, he tried to hide it. And when, you know, he thought he was doing good. He thought, he thought I, you know, I, no one's going to say anything, right? Because, you know, these, I, I saved this Israelite, you know, my, my brother. You know, he's not, nothing's going to happen, right? But, it, you know, he, it, he didn't get the reaction he was expected. And so he got scared and he ran. He fled to, uh, to Midian. And there he lived 40 years. You know, he, he, he lived with uh, Jethro, he, he married his daughter, but he lived in a very humble way where it was not really talked about much. But we can kind of get a little sense of what's happening here, because what did he become when he went to Midian? A shepherd. He was a shepherd for 40 years. Now, so that's a big change from being a prince of Egypt, and then all of a sudden, you're, 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 you're driven away from your home, and now you're in some foreign land, you're a stranger and an alien, and you have to live as, um, in f for 40 years as a shepherd. Now, we, we, can, we can glean as, we, as you study, what did the Egyptians think of shepherds? Lowly. Not, not, they even used the word abomination, right? They thought of the shepherd job as the lowliest thing. And I can imagine being a shepherd is a very boring job. You're just going out, you're out there by yourself with a bunch of sheep. Right, you know, Moses had a very. I'm sure it's not an easy job having to deal with sheep that are not so smart and stubborn, you know, getting lost all the time and having to herd them over. And he did this for 40 years, living out in the desert, in the wilderness, you know. And and, and after having spent another 40 years, previous 40 years, you know, living in luxury and living in wisdom with wisdom and and all this education and all these things. And I call that period in his life the humbling of Moses not talked about but it was so important because what happened right after um um right after those 40 years once once chapter 3 began we saw then Moses finally heard the voice of the Lord calling to him and so when that i i that i i think that humbly even though that even though that part of Moses' life those 40 years isn't really recorded in the bible but it played it played such an integral role for Moses to be able to become the servant of God. And I think it speaks of for us the importance of needing to deny ourselves when it comes to following after the Lord and listening for the Lord as he speaks to us. You know, we can't get to that um, point. We, can't get, we cannot get to, to be able to have that relationship with God if our self-life is so puffed up, right? Um, it should be a humbling thing for us to know that the creator of this universe, who created us, wants to be our friend. It should be humbling for us to recognize how much he wants to have be a part of your life. And not just, you know, 
on a very, you know, high level. He wants to be part of your life day, day in and day out, to know every part of you, um, to play a part in your life in a daily, in a personal, in, in, a, in an intimate way. But oftentimes, we go through our lives, you know, not not letting the Lord really take this, you know, take hold of the steering wheel, if I may borrow a phrase from a popular song, right? We tend to like to stay on the driver's seat and relegate the Lord to the back seat until something happens, right? Then we need the Lord. Then we need to pray. And then we need to invite the Lord and Lord, I really need you. But that's not what, that's not the relationship God wants with us. He wants to be part of our lives and have the intimate relationship with each and every day. How he knows, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he wants to reveal himself to us. But we get in the way. You know, we oftentimes have things in our lives that, in, that distract us or um, cause us to really neglect that, 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 that heart of the Lord. That what he really wanted for us in the very beginning. Um, and so, you know, I I I um I wanted to share a little bit of my, you know, that 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 part of my life. Because as I was saying, I was as I was going through high school and college, I didn't really come to really walk with the Lord. Or at least recognize my that where my relationship with the Lord until I got through most of halfway through college. And I was struggling through much of much of the beginning. Uh, because I was focused, I had, a, I had an idol in my life, a uh, real, uh, something that I couldn't let go of. And that was, you know, that, that was something I had decided from the very beginning. So to give a little bit of a background in my, of my life and my childhood, um, you know, my father had, uh, had decided to move to Puerto Rico when I was very young. Um, he, he found, he, you know, he had some connections in Puerto Rico, found a job there, and he moved there to work. And, you know, looking back at it, of course, now that I'm much older, looking back at it, I recognize, you know, that at that time, my father obviously did it with, with good intentions. He, he, he wanted, he, he, he couldn't, you know, whether, you know, he couldn't find a job here. He, you know, was struggling with that. He, he knew some people over there. He moved there. And his, in, his, in his good intentions, he did it so that he would be able to raise money for his family. And I, and I get that now. But, uh, you know, 10-year-old me at that time, you know, didn't understand any of that. I didn't understand the nuances of that. Of that. And so I grew up with the, with, the, with, the, um, with the idea of knowing that, you know, of the, you know, that feeling having been abandoned by my father. Um, and it left a lot of resentment in my life. Um, that uh, I grew up for most most of my formative le years without him. You know, he he would come, he would visit every so often. Uh, you know, every once or twice a year, but for the most part of my childhood, he he was not around. And I I made it a point. I decided very early. You know, maybe probably you know at, at when I when I when you know having st you know started to come to my own in high school, I made it a point to as a goal in my life to prove that I didn't need him, that I could be successful in my life without my father in my, to be, without needing my father in my life. And so I hung on, I took hold of the, the aspect of the, what I thought would measure success in my life. So, you know, clinging on to those very typical Asian stereotypes, I decided to be, what? A doctor, exactly, a doctor. That may not be true nowadays. I don't know what. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that has changed nowadays. Um, but at that time, when I was starting high school, I felt well, you know what? If I were to, if I was going to prove to the world that I didn't need my father, I was going to um, become a doctor and and show everybody that I didn't need him. Right? That I that I was perfectly fine without him. And, and just now I need to step back and put a disclaimer. Uh, this is not a, a workshop telling you don't be a doctor. In fact, I see one right there. And absolutely not. This is, this is the personal, uh, I want to share my personal example of how the Lord led me. And the Lord will lead each and every one of you in a personal way. And he will show you the things that are in your life that need to be dealt with. And the things in your life that need to be worked out with in order 
for that growth, that, that experience with the Lord to become something much deeper. We, he does not want us to be knowing him on a superficial level. But to know him in a deeper way, there are things that need to be dealt with in our lives. And the pride in my life was cl- clinging on to this resentment of my father and the need to prove that I didn't need him by becoming successful. So I, that's, what I, what, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a doctor no matter what. And, and for the most part, I, you know, I, I did very well in school at first. You know, I, much, through much of junior high, I was you know, in the top of my class. I even got into um, a, you know, a very prestigious high school. I'm not going to say it because someone's going to make fun of me. Uh, but you know, I, I, but it was, it, when I got, once I got into high school, then things started to become reality to me because now I was in a, in a, in a high school, in a school where you know, a lot, there were a lot more people smarter than me. And all of a sudden, I, wa- I, I wasn't as smart as I thought I could be, or I thought I was. And, and so when, we, um, when I... Um, um, was, you know, uh, you know, thinking about applying to college, you know, I had all these dreams, you know, I was going to get, you know, got to get into, I, you know, I, I had this like amazing, like 10 year plan, get into the perfect college, um, graduate, go right into med school, get through that, do some, do some specialization and then boom, I'm right there out success. And then I can show my, I can prove to the world that I've done it and I didn't need my father. That was my, that was my mindset. That was my goal through much of high school and into college and at first. Into co- and does someone and, have a question? <laughs> no, I guess not. So, um, and so as the first, so there were a couple uh, humbling things for me. That first was when I realized that, as I was saying in high school, that I didn't really measure up to the to the very top cream of the crop in school and so even though i had these dreams to get into an ivy league school and i knew i was really trying to push really hard to get you know you know measure that success that way but unfortunately i didn't get into the college that i really wanted to go to got rejected to every single ivy league i applied to um and it was a it was very devastating for me um even though you know i felt my you know my, my sat score was good i felt my gpa was pretty good but it wasn't good enough compared to everybody else and so I learned the hard way that, you know, it's not, you're not, you're not always going to, you know, there's always going to be other people that are potentially smarter and better than you at these things. And that was a, the first devastating point, the first humbling in my life. Um, when I supposedly had to settle for, you know, my, my safety school, everyone talks about safety schools. You know, my safety school at that time was uh, NYU, New York University. Some of you are laughing, you know, everyone's laughing. We're like, oh, that's your safety school. Are you kidding me? That's see, that's the pride of my life that I thought, you know, a good school like NYU was a safety school. I couldn't accept the fact that I had to settle for that school. But nevertheless, I, 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 I took it upon myself. You know what? Fine. If the Lord is telling me to go to NYU, fine. I'll do that. I'll get through NYU. I'll breeze through it like I should be. And I'll get into medical school. And the plan hasn't been derailed. I'm still good. Um, so... Once I got into, once I got in, I said, you know what? I'm going to do the pre-med track. I'm going to take all the advanced courses I could get, you know, breeze through it, show that I don't, you know, I don't have to like take the, you know, the entry level sciences. I took all the APs, AP sciences in class, in high school. I can just place out of those entry level sciences. And I said, you know what? Ooh, hey, that, uh, let me do this. Molecular, molecular and cell biology. That sounds good. I'm going to take that. And that, that class uh, really like, you know, for all intents and purposes, really, it was a humbling experience. Um, I remember being totally unprepared and thinking that I knew everything. When I came home, that very first test, I got a D. And I never had a, I never had a D in my life. Somehow, I thought I understood the material, but I did not understand the material. And so when I had that D, I reckon I realized, what am I doing? And so I tried really hard. To, to bring that grade up. And, and I, you know, and eventually I did much better in some of the, in the later tests, but, you know, it's very hard to recover from a D. And so those, so those that you, you know, you know, if you're in a pre-med track and you want to go to med school, um, starting off like that, you pretty much put yourself behind the eight ball. And it was, uh, it was a very difficult thing to recover from. And so I went, so after that, I really struggled 
with the Lord. And I was really angry because I did not real I did I, I did not know why the Lord would not allow me to achieve this dream that I had because I because of, of, of the, all the things I had built up in my life in high school, the pride in my life, the need to um, prove myself to to this world that I, I I grew up you know perfectly fine without my father. I, I was really angry, and and it it, it stuck. It, it's it, it kept with me throughout much of my college period. And it wasn't until it wasn't until halfway when I met some brothers and sisters that led me to finally being able to open up and and join a college fellowship to be able to relate to brothers and sisters uh, who who you know went through the same struggles as I did, uh, and, and and being able to open up that I started feeling that the Lord was trying to lead me back to Him, to have a relationship with Him, to, 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 to have a relationship that would be deeper than what I know of Him in a superficial way. And I recognized that I really needed, that this was the idol in my life. This was the point of pride in my life, that the Lord was slowly, you know, I wish it was, you know, you know I mean, I'm th thankful it wasn't 40 years like Moses, but it was a slow process for the Lord to deal with this point in my life in order to say, you need to lay this down. Because if I, if I were to be useful to the Lord, if I were to really deepen my, my walk and grow with the Lord, these are the things in my life that needed to be laid down and, and let go of. And so through that process, the Lord was beginning to do that restoring in my life. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, the Lord, from the very beginning, even after the fall of man, has been, has been searching for a way to restore that relationship he has with man, with you, to the way what was meant to be from the very beginning. Um, that we may know him and we may have fellowship with him. That we may um, um, have that intimate personal relationship with him as he intended for us to. And to be honest, and, and, and really, that wasn't possible if the Lord didn't set that way and make that way possible and show us the example when he sent his son, the perfect example of humility. You know, it is, it is amazing to me. I recognize where even we think of hum, being humbled, right, as such a th something that really brings you down to the very lowest of yourself, right? I, 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 I had to really, you know, be in my knees recognizing how, how much pride I had. And I was brought down to, to my very lowest, but it is, it is at your lowest that the Lord stoops down and, reach, and, and is able to come to your level and lift you up. Because that's what the Lord Jesus did for us. When he humbled himself and he came down and he saw us and walked the path that we walked and, was able, and, and saved us uh, and sought us out. You know, the Lord Jesus became that example for us. And, and because... He was that example for us because he came down to our level. You know, we, we read, you know, we know our ver the theme verse in 1 John chapter 5, right? We are able to know God because the Son of God has come and given us an understanding, right? We, we are able to know God when we are able to see Jesus and, he's in, and we are in him. We are able to know God because our Lord Jesus came to us and he saw us and he found us. And so... Um, you know, those, those points in our lives when we are at our lowest, oftentimes, you know, it's a very, you know, uh, vulnerable, you know, it's, you know, you're kind of very in a, in a, in a very vulnerable position, you know, it, because you're, you know, when you deny yourselves, you find yourself, you're no longer in control of your life. And for my, for, for my example, when I realized that the, this, the, you know, I, even though I went, I continued along with my pre-med track and I still, I tried every way. So sort of figure out how can I, you know, sort of supplement my, um, you know, poor GPA, you know, I, you know, get a, get a, get a good score on my MCATs, you know, try to like supplement with extracurriculars and all these things that will help bolster my chances. Um, you know, I applied, of course, you know, my only, but I still had no plan. My only plan was graduate, go to med school and continue forward. So after, you know, you know, prior to graduation, I began another process of, you know, applying to med schools. I applied to as many schools as I thought, I, you know, as possible. Um, 
And of course, um, again, in, 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 in humility, had to accept all the, all the rejection letters coming in. I, I hung on to one, which was a, I, had, I was waitlisted for one school, and I clung on to that as my, like, like, you know, like the last lifeline in this dream, um, still unable to let go. And I clung on to that even after graduating college, you know, waiting, okay, do I have a chance? Do I have a chance? Will they let me in? And then when finally that last letter came in saying, sorry, all the spaces are filled, you know, then at that time, no more, no more chances. I, I had not, I was left with nothing. Um, I was graduated. I had no job lined up. I was left at home. I was again, you know, living at home in my mother's basement, um, doing nothing but um, you know, going online, playing video games, watching TV. For a couple of months, I I had nothing lined up, and I was doing nothing except thinking that, well, I guess since I have nothing I can do, I'll try again next year. Not realizing that, um, you know, the Lord was showing me another way um and i remember you know having i, I remember very clearly one one morning mid-morning when everyone else you know i'm sure people in my people of my of my, my my classmates and those i knew in high school have already started their careers and gone off and do these things i was here i was sitting in my room in, in my in my in my mother's basement thinking halfway through you know in, in halfway through the day thinking what am i doing with my life and at that time i you know, got a call and, you know, through some connection, someone had said, oh, you know, I, I think I, I would, you know, Kelvin, I have a job, you know, we can offer you. Um, you should, you know, it's, you can work at, I have a job opening at some, some lab. Um, and I thought, hey, okay, that's, that's good. It's a, uh, you know, maybe this is a way, right? If I work at a lab, I work for a little bit, maybe it'll be a stepping stone to, to somehow whatever, you know, you know, going through trying to reestablish what, what I wanted as a stepping stone. Um, but when I, but having taken this job, I recognized, wait a minute, all I was, all I was doing in this job was basically transcribing reports, um, you know, typing out test results and sending it to patients, you know, as a standard desk job. And I, you know, once again, you know, that resentment grew thinking that, well, what, what am, again, this is going nowhere. I'm just sitting here like typing reports and, and, and living, working out this desk job. And I remember clearly, that as I heard the sharing uh, of a sister who was maybe going through something similar, but she had, um, in one of the open sharings, my, uh, the sister shared how, you know, her career, she, she wasn't in the position she thought her career would lead her to. And she was, you know, essentially, you know, you know, you know, put in a, you know, a glorified desk job. And she was humbled by the Lord to recognize that, um, you know, th that she, regardless of whatever position or whatever she was doing, you know, should be doing it um, to the best of her ability to glorify the Lord because that's what the Lord provided for her. And I remember as I heard that message that I heard the Lord speak to me and say, basically, essentially, do you not trust me? Do you think that you know better uh, than I know you? Do you think you know how, better of what, how, to lead, how to lead your life? than I do. And so from then on, I echoed that sister's prayer. And I said, Lord, if this is what you want me to be, then I will do it to the best of my ability. Because I recognize that you are the one who is leading me. You are the one who knows me better than I know myself. And when I prayed that, I, 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 I began to recognize how much the Lord wanted to be the one in the driver's seat of my life because he wanted to have that relationship with me, that I would pray to him each and every day uh, to invite him to be part of my daily life and every to, to be part of every decision, to be part of every situation in my life so that he would be the one who is truly the master of my life, not me, who thinks no, he knows better than, than, than who, who, who created me. Um, and so... Um, I think we recognize that, you know, there are those examples in the Bible that, that we see the same way. Moses, as I shared, Abraham, you know, what did, what did, what, what did, uh, in, in James, what did they call Abraham uh, in his relationship with God? 
right? They even, they even said that he was like a, a friend of God because he was able to speak with God as a friend would speak. God, God would it be, God, he would even, you know, it's amazingly, he, he spoke with God. He even, he even was able to bargain with God when he, you know, when God told him that he was going to, you know, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, um, it, it would, that, that relationship could not be there if it wasn't for Abraham's faith in God and trusting in God and what God said. You know, whatever God told, told, wherever God told Abraham to go, he went. And for the most part, right? Whatever God told Abraham to do, he did. And that faith that Abraham had of God was counted into him, uh, was, was credited to him as righteousness. And it's because of that faith and trust of him, that he had in God. He had such a relationship with God that he could be called a friend of God. And we also reminded of Paul. You know, Paul had, we know Paul had, Paul, when we, you know, previously, when he was Saul, had everything, right? He had the lineage. He had the education. He had the training. He had the profession. Um, he had talent. And all those things we read, in, in, when we read him share in Philippians chapter 3, all those things that he, that in the world's eyes, you know, puffed him up in such a way that he was someone so great. But when he was met on the road to Damascus and blinded by the Lord and saw Jesus for real, and he was, you know, and, and then became blind and had to be led by someone and had to learn how to submit to brothers, like, you know, you submit to those like Peter, like those that he tried to persecute, he had to learn to submit to. It was a, it's a hum, he had to go through a humbling. But when we read in Philippians chapter 3, we saw the heart, you know, what, what, what Paul had to recognize is that all of those things he had, he considered as rubbish. He counted all things as, as, lo as loss and everything else as loss in comparison, in, 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 in comparison to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. And, that, and he shared the secret, brothers and sisters, the secret of our denying of ourselves. Because when Paul recognized that he did, when he denied these things, when he counted all these things as loss and rubbish, it wasn't just him, him denying it and then he was left in his lowly state. But what did he gain but Christ? Because we, the secret is that when we learn to deny ourselves and humble ourselves, the Lord comes and fills us with himself and he picks us up and restores us into a rightful, beautiful, intimate relationship with him. And so when Moses saw that, right, um, Moses went through that 40 years of humility, even throughout the time that he was being led by, you know, you know, he didn't think much of himself. Even God even had to be angry with Moses sometimes. It's like, you know who created man? You know who made your mouths talk? Who give who gave who gave the mouths to man to talk, right? He was so he was so like nervous about speaking to before Pharaoh, you know. But throughout all that, even even throughout all that, um, you know, how how did how, it, which is kind of funny. I was thinking this funny funny because Moses described Moses is described in numbers as what? You guys, you guys remember when, you know, the, the story when um, even, even his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam spoke up against Moses. He's like, why, why, why is Moses being favored by God? Hey, we're, we're, we're important too. Why doesn't God speak to us? And then, and then what did they say about Moses? He's the humblest. Yeah. He, he was the most humble man <laughs> over any band, which is kind of funny. He, he wrote numbers, right? And he wrote that about himself. But it's probably true. Because he went through that period of humility, 40 years of being brought to the very lowest. And, and, and even when his own brother and sister spoke up against him, he didn't dare say a word. He didn't speak, he didn't speak um, against that, right? He, he had, it had to be God. God came and defended Moses. He's like, wait a minute. You know, I, do you recognize that with all these other prophets, I speak to them in dreams and visions, but with Moses... My the one I know by name, I call by name. I know him. He has found favor in my eyes. I speak to him like a friend, face to face. Right? It was you know God had to God defended Moses, right? He he and and it's in humility, right? Moses, that it was. It's only out of humility and a denying of yourselves can can we be even considered to be able to be a servant for the Lord in such a way, to have that intimate relationship where we can say God can speak to us face to face. And thank the Lord, because he has made that way possible. Back then, you know, like it's very rare, right? Moses, Abraham, you, you read these very rare examples of people in the Bible that are able to have that relationship with God. 
But we are thankful, brothers and sisters, because today we have the Lord Jesus and he has given us the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's because we are in him, we are able to know him, right? Moses recognized the most important thing. And we read, we read in Exodus chapter 33. This is after, if you remember, in Exodus, just before that chapter that we read, the Israelites committed a grave sin, right? And what was that? They made the golden calf, right? They committed a grave sin, right? Moses had gone up to the Mount Sinai to speak with God. They, they, the, the, but the people of Israel got impatient. They told Aaron, make us a golden calf, right? They committed a grave sin of idolatry, right? And so the Lord was very angry with the people of Israel. And here, Moses interceded for them, right? And, and at this point, he's like, if, if you, we, God had promised the people of Israel the, to, that the, the land of Canaan is theirs. Right? That was already God's promise. You go. Right? And so at that point, the Lord was so angry, he was saying, go, you know, just go. Right? Go to the land I promised you. And Moses here recognized the most important thing about this journey and this walk and this relationship with the Lord. He's, he's saying, Lord, if you do not go with us, do not send us there. You know, you, you, we, we know the promise of God, what, has, what God has promised us. Those who are saved, those we, we know who we, are, we belong to the Lord. We know we have... This, the understanding of eternity with the Lord Jesus. And amen, praise the Lord, we have that. But as our brothers have shared already, this matter of eternal life is not a matter just of an experience that we're going to have in the future, later on. But this, this experience of eternity, eternal life with the Lord, is something that we ought to be experiencing now, today, in this relationship with Him. And when Moses, and when, when Moses heard the Lord saying, go, he's saying, but we, who, how, what, what will distinguish us from the rest of this, from the rest of the nations of the world, if your presence is not with us, if you do not go with us? And so when he, when he said that, God, God promised him, my presence will be with you, and I will go with you. And then Moses would even dare go even further, and then say, if I have found favor in your eyes, Lord, show me your glory. Brothers and sisters, this is a cry from Moses, saying to God, God, Lord, show me your ways so that I may know your ways, that I may know you. He wanted to see his glory because he wanted to see exactly everything that of who God is, who he is, what makes God God, his ways. When he said, show me your glory, he was saying to God, I want to know you. And brothers and sisters, if that's the question that we have in our hearts and our desire today uh, for this conference, even as we're going through these difficult periods in our lives, right? As our brother shared in this morning, as you, even as we're going through this period of isolation and difficulty, you know, relate, you know, have, not being not being able to be with brothers and sisters you know, together, and I and I and I amen, my brother. You know, it's a very difficult time, especially for you guys in your age. You know, maybe you know, especially even those, maybe even harder for the high schoolers up there. Um, and yet, and, and it is true. But yet, even in these periods of isolation, right? Maybe the Lord is leading us through a period where He's showing us those areas in our lives that need to be dealt with. That we, when we need to seek for humility and we need to learn to deny ourselves, then the Lord can meet us there. And he can show and he can reveal himself to us in such a way that perhaps our, the cry of our heart, just like Moses cried out, and just like, just like the Lord showed me when I was at a period where I was at, in my lowest estate, where I had no, when I was thinking in my life, thinking to myself, what am I doing with my life? The only thing I could say, you know, at that point was God revealed himself to me and said um, and told me, you know, do you trust me? And Moses here trusted God to the point where he said, I, we dare, I dare not go. Do not send us there if you do not go with us. Lord, show me your glory. Show me who you are. Reveal yourself to me. You are the only thing that distinguishes us from anything else in this world. Uh, from the rest of the people of this, of this nation, of these of the people of this earth, because of you, your presence 
is 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 what makes it is the only thing that's important for us. And so without us, do not send us. If you do not go with us, do not send us there. And so the Lord, you know, God. I, I can only surmise that God was pleased to show, you know some of his glory, right? He couldn't show everything because Moses would die and like just, you know, be, you know, it, but with so, some of his glory, he was able to see it by, by passing through him, you know, while he was hidden in the cleft of the rock. And brothers and sisters, I, you know, it, with that experience, I have to say, if we think of it nowadays, how, how, how blessed we are because we have the Lord Jesus, who we know the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. We, the full glory of God can be seen in the Lord Jesus. And he has made it, his, and it was in his pleasure to reveal God to us. And we are in him. And if we're willing to say to him, show me your glory. If we're willing to say, I want to know you, Jesus. Don't, don't think he won't, do, he won't, you know. Don't, do you think he will hide, like, hide things, you know, from you? If you're, if you're earnestly seeking him, he, how much he desires to reveal himself to you. From the very beginning, when Adam and Eve fell, his heart was seeking to restore that relationship, seeking to reestablish and recover that which was lost. And brothers and sisters, if we are willing to deny ourselves, if we're willing to even go, you know, be humble and, 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 and lay down the things which encumber us, then, we are willing, then, then we're able to press on with the Lord, then we're able to have a relationship with the Lord that can be deepened and can grow, right? A, 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 light, a, a relationship of life can only be there if there is growth, not stagnation, not on a superficial level, but growing deeper and deeper. So, brothers and sisters, that's, that's, that's my sharing. Um, I, I hope it was helpful um, as a personal you know, experience each and every one of us will go through with the Lord. The Lord will show us the things that he, you know, needs to, he wants to show us. And maybe, may we be willing um, to press on with him, to lay down those things um, and say, Lord, I, I, I want to gain you, that I will value knowing you and having you more important than anything else in this world. Shall we close in prayer? Lord, we recognize, Lord, um, Lord, that in of ourselves, Lord, we are so rebellious in our nature and oftentimes we think we know what is best. Um, we like to be in control. Um, we think we know um, what, what we need to do in our lives. Yet, rec yet we forget how, you know, Lord Jesus, you are the one who created us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so, Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, that you were willing to stoop down to our level, to reach to us, and to come down and, and save us so that we may know you that we may have a part in you and that we may grow with you um, and walk with you in this uh, journey through this wilderness to have your presence with us. Lord, our desire is that we would not just know you in a very superficial way, know you as if in, 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 our, in, in our head, but Lord, may we know you intimately, personally, uh, because it, is, it, it was in your d design, Lord, that we may have fellowship with you. And so, Lord, we, we commit ourselves to you. We know that there are many things in our lives that uh, can often be a distraction um, and get in the way. We lay those things down before you, and we say, Lord, may you uh, take may we, may you help us to this to count those things as loss, uh, in view of the surpassing value of knowing you and gaining you. Lord Jesus, may you have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.